Good morning, Hope Church. Good morning, Hope. Good morning, Hope. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house. And well, we're in our houses, so this is make it the house of the Lord. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Church, House of Prayer and Evangelism. And we are so grateful that you are here with us today because we are committed to God serving humanity. We just want to welcome all of our friends, all of our family, all of our guests into the house and houses of the Lord. So at this time, we are going to have Reverend Gerald Smith do a scripture and a prayer so we can get started with our worship. Amen. Scripture will be coming from Ephesians, the second chapter. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. That's Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. And it reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly God, our Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day, this time and opportunity you've given us to gather, to come before your presence, to worship you, to honor you, and to glorify you. God, I thank you for all who have um, listened to you and obeyed your command to wake up this morning with a reasonable portion of life, health, and strength to come, God, to serve you, to come with thanksgiving, to come with praises, to come, God, uh, in a spirit and a heart of worship. We ask, oh God, that all things that are done today are to your glory and to your honor. God, we pray for our church family. We continue to lift them up to you. We ask that you would just have your way because this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad. So God, thank you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. In the matchless name of Jesus, who is truly and certainly the Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 The whole church, we are truly missing you and gathering together in one place but we know that we are all sharing together. Uh, as the Lord gives our pastor vision, we've been meeting every morning at eight o'clock. We've been having Bible study on Thursdays, going into prayer with our first lady. And so that shows us that we are all still very much connected and in fellowship with the master. So going along with that thinking, our worshiping arts ministry, they put together a little presentation for us just so we can feel connected and we should, can worship our God together. And after our worshiping arts ministry goes forth, then we're going to hear from our pastor, Amen. the Reverend Dr. Clifford Wright Sr., the pastor of House of Prayer and Evangelism, Hope Church in Downbrook, New Jersey. See you in a, in a little bit, Hope.
Praise God. Wasn't that beautiful? We serve an awesome God who give us opportunity to know him, to, to serve him that way. So good morning. Good morning, Hope Church, people of God, friends and family. It's a good thing for us to be able to come together and worship our God, and to serve him, to be remindful that he is yet a miracle worker. He is worthy of praise. He's worthy of honor. It is our privilege, our responsibility to magnify the Lord. But we serve a God who is truly, truly worthy. So worthy of all, of all praise and all honor. I ask you to join me in a word of prayer, please. Master God, we thank you, we praise you for who you are. We thank you, God, for the privilege that you've given us to, to gather over the airways that we might worship you. Dear God, we know that you can hear us. We know that you see us. We pray, God, that you would receive our offering of praise. As we seek to acknowledge you, to exalt you, to magnify your name, we pray, God, that you would strengthen us and keep us. Encourage our hearts, dear God, that we might live faithfully before you. So, Lord, we surrender now, and we pray, God, that you would speak to us. Speak to our hearts, our life, and our living. Speak, dear God until we're transformed into the individuals 
the community, the church, the people that you would have us to be. So God, we give your name praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. For you alone, you are God and you are worthy. It's in the blessed name of him who's yet alive, Jesus who is the Christ, we do pray. Hope Church, we serve a wonderful God, people of God. We serve somebody, uh, a Lord who is so loving and kind. And I stand today to give him honor. I give him honor because he is due all honor. It doesn't matter what's going on in our lives, what's happening around us. We serve a God who is worthy of all praise. And I give him honor in this, his house today because he is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And as always, I'm going to invite you and encourage you to come and see Jesus with me because I still believe if we can sing, we can make it. Life is difficult and restrictive and, and sometimes it, it seems to be more challenging than we can handle. It's definitely more than we want. But God is able and he will make a way out of no way. So if you, if you will, come, come let us go look into his word together that we might discover God's will, God's plan. For our lives. So if you have your Bibles, come with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading at verse 8. And it reads Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What an awesome word and promise and encouragement for us because we go through life and it appears from time to time that life gets difficult and, and, and hard for us to handle. And we get, um, I do, get discouraged from time to time. I look around and, and I wonder, I wonder how long is this going to last and, and can I last as long as it does? I, I wonder what's going on with this with this thing, and I feel I feel myself starting to to waver, let my mind slip and and be distracted. And I don't know. I, I believe that that there's some of you who may find yourself in the same situation where it just sometimes seems a little heavy, a little strange. You you don't really know what's going on. There's all kinds of of information and ideas floating around, and we don't know what to do with all of them. And it's not just with COVID nineteen. Life itself sometimes brings us issues that we just don't know how to handle, disappointments that seem like it's going to crush us, health issues and problems and family issues and problems and employment issues and problems and financial issues and problems. Things come into our lives and we don't always know how to handle them, how to deal with them. But that, that's what the Bible helps us with. And God gives us his word so that we can discover how we can love him and serve him and, and, and accomplish what he has, has a, uh, called us to do. And, and to be what he's called us to be. So we look at the text that the apostle writes, Apostle Paul writes to, to the church of Philemon and, 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 and Philemon. And we, when we look at the church of Philemon, what he, he, he is, he is Philippi, Philippi, that's the word. When he looks at the church of Philippi, what we discover is that he's encouraging them to be faithful and strong. And he, he's helping them to discover to, that, that we ought to model ourselves after Christ who came as one of us. Why is that? Because it is when we stay strong, when we stay faithful, when we stay committed. So when we look at this text today, what I really want us to remember and to be encouraged is stay with your strength. Don't let the enemy trick you into putting your, your, your strength down. Don't let him deceive you so you will leave the strong tower. Stay in your place of protection. Stay in the place where God has called you so he can keep us safe and defend us and use us for his glory. How does this text help us with that? Well, if you, if you look at it, Jesus, who is very God, Jesus, who is 
absolutely God. He, he decided that he would take on the appearance of one of us so that he could not only show us how to, to get to God, he could show us how to live for God and to live with God. See, because we, we, we know we're going to heaven. We have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. But the, the thing that challenges us most is how do we live with and for God on the journey? How do, how do I please God with my life and live for God as I'm living my life so that God is pleased? So when I get to heaven, I, I hear the well done, that, that a, a small portion, not a vast portion of my life is consumed by the fires that tries or judge my actions and my behavior. So when I, I go to this thing, we're dealing with this situation, Jesus says, I'm going to become like one of you so I can show you how you're supposed to live this thing and how you're supposed to live for the one who saved you. Now, what we can take out of this thing, this text first, or at least what hit me first of all, was that Jesus was not humbled by God or by his circumstances or anyone else. It was not the outside of Christ that humbled him. Paul tells us that Jesus humbled himself. It was a decision, a choice, a, a matter of his will that he humbled himself, which implied he didn't have to. Jesus did not have to humble himself, just as neither do we. We don't have to humble ourselves before God. It is a matter of choice. We have to decide that I'm going to humble myself before God. Now, that brought up another question for me, and that question is, what is humble? What, what does that mean? Because for us, humble sometimes looks like a, a, a weakness. It looks like somehow we are we are weak or, or we're, it's self-hatred or it's putting yourself down. But that's not humility. That's not being humble. Putting yourself down and, and hating on yourself and hating on those who look like you. That's not, that's not being humble and, and, and treating yourself like, as though you're weak and you can't do anything or, or you're being, being ultra passive and, 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 and being intens intentionally passive in an aggressive way. That's not humble. That's not humble. That, 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 that's, that's something totally different. Humility comes to us from, from an internal source. Humility happens when, when we decide that we are going to acknowledge a power and authority that is so vastly greater than us that it deserves our reverence. It, he deserves our, our commitment, our sacrifice to him. You, that's what humility is. It's, it's the lowering of oneself for, for, for the purpose of seeing others higher and more exalted. Now, we can't exalt God any higher than he's already exalted, but when we humble ourselves, get lower before God, God becomes even bigger in our individual and personal lives. How is that? What does that mean? Well, if we look at kind of the play of how we handle uh, words that come out of this world, this word humble, we, we can kind of see how um, it, 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 it plays out in our lives. Because we many times we think of the word humiliation at, at one way, and we think of the word humility in another, but they, they both kind of come from the same root word, which means to be pushed down and low. But when we think about being uh, humiliated, we, we, we concentrate on the force that is outside of us that acts on us. We think of how people on the outside are looking at us, and we feel foolish, or we feel full of shame, or, or regret, or disappointment. We feel humiliated. We, we, we get pushed down against our will because of the external forces around us is looking at us in a way that is, is compressing us and making us fall to the ground. But when I am humble, when, when humility is there, it is a virtue. It's something that flows from the inside. It doesn't matter how they're looking at me on the outside. It doesn't matter what environment is around you. You have now decided that you are uh, positioned in a way that you're supposed to be lower than the authority. Now that sounds like that sounds like well you're putting yourself down. Not really. Think of it this way: if you if you contemplate the vastness of our universe, if you contemplate the, the power of an erupting volcano, and then you consider your own vastness or your own power, you would come to the conclusion that your power, that your vastness, is insignificant compared to the vastness of the universe or an erupting volcano. You don't have the power of, of a volcano fully erupting. You don't have the vastness in your person of a universe that is always expanding and growing. 
It's not to deny that you have value. It's not to deny your beauty. It's not to deny your power. It's not to say you have no strength. It's not to proclaim you have no ability. No, it is to say I am full of God-given ability. I'm full of God-given beauty. But what I know is that I am not the artist of my own beauty. I am not the architect of my own intellect. I am not the creator. I don't have that. There is a vastness that is far beyond me. And the Bible says that we talk about being humbled by the power of the universe, being humbled by, by the beauty of a landscape or a sunrise. Why is that? Because when you see the sun rising in all its beauty, in all of its glory, it makes you from inside, internally says, God is great. God is magnificent. God is honored. God, that's what humble is. So it says that Jesus, he humbled himself. He didn't deny his power, he didn't deny his strength. He didn't lay down his divinity. He didn't stop being God. He just, as a man, humbled himself before God. He says, God, I come to you and I understand, Father, the master, the, the mass and the magnitude of your power and your strength. And while I'm in this human flesh, it is so much greater. I, I humble myself before you. That's what he said and that's what he said. So what we discover is it is the position of a, of a humble heart. It's the humility of the human spirit that puts us in the position to please God. I can't please God if I'm full of pride and selfishness. I can't please God if I'm only looking out for myself. I can't please God if I'm full of self-pity, self-doubt, self-hatred. I can't please God. In fact, hating myself is an affront to God because God created me. And if I think there's something so terribly wrong with me, I'm saying to God, God, you didn't get me right. You made a mistake. So it's not about self-hatred. It's about saying, God, you've made me wonderful and you made me powerful. And God, you made me strong. But in light of who you are, it is right for me to worship you. It is right for me to lower myself in your presence. I humble myself before you, oh God. See, that's what Jesus did and put him in a position. But he could do what? Please God. That what the text suggests to us, and what I hear the text screaming at me, is that humility and obedience are linked together. I can't be humble and disobedient. And I can't, I can't truly be disobedient if I'm humble. Because they're linked together, they're tied together. If I see God as the ultimate power and authority in my life, then everything in me wants to please him. And if I want to please him, I'm going to do his will. Obedience is not just carrying out the dictates of the order. Obedience is a heart, a mind that says, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to understand the heart of what you're telling me so I can pattern my life after what you taught me. Obedience says, not only will I do what you said, but I will become what you told me to do. I will be the person who can love, not just the person that hands out services. I will be the person who are on prayer and not just a person who pray once when the time is right. I'm not going to be a prayer. I'm, going, I'm not just going to pray. I'm going to be a prayer. I'm going to be one that you, you taught me how to do this thing because obedience shapes our lives. Obedience changes the way we think. Obedience is a lifestyle. Obedience is a part of our, our character, our nature. Obedience becomes ingrained in my spirit, in your spirit. It's not just the activities of your limb, but it's the functionality of your mind. It's the it's a, it's a fullness of your spirit and your character. So it says that Jesus obeyed to the point of death, even death on the cross. So it's not, it's not just he went to the cross. He obeyed the whole journey because obedience was in his nature. So we have to come to this place where we see that my strength is to humble myself before God. My strength is to have this nature, this, this wherewithal to obey God, this mindset to obey God, that I'm just not going to do the right thing. I'm going to be the right thing. I'm going to be what God has called me to do. So out of my being flows my doing. Out of my being with God flows my honoring of God. Out of my, my mindset to please God flows my obedient behavior before God. Because who God has caused me to become shapes what I do with my life. That, that's why many of us live in such conflict and turmoil because we're trying to do the things of God without becoming the person God wants us to be. 
We got to change our hearts and our minds and let God transform us. And in transformation of our spirit, we become living examples of God's glory and God's honor. So we have to obey because obedience and humility are linked, tied, tied together. You can't pull them apart. They're, 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 they're intertwined one with another. You can't be prideful and obedient. You, you, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't be full of fear and doubt and be obedient. You, you have to be the, the person who is humble before God, who trusts God's authority so you can go forward and be what God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. Jesus Christ, he became obedient, obedient unto death, the Bible says. And when we look at this thing, obedience unto God is, 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 is the key to God blessing us and giving us what we need. So, so if you look at the text, it says that Jesus took on the form of man. He came up, took on the fashion of man, he, the appearance of man, and he was obedient unto God, even unto death, obedient unto the death of the cross. He, he was obedient. And then it says, for this reason, therefore, for this cause, God has highly exalted him. So you see, it, 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 God exalted Jesus in reaction to response to Jesus, to humble obedience. God, God lifted him because he lowered himself. When we get in our, our strength position, our, our strong position, we, we, we lower ourselves. Think about good athletes when they talk about get in an athletic post posture. You don't stand straight. There's a squatting, there's a bending, there's a getting ready. You anchor yourself in the ground because now you say, I'm not going to be moved. I'm anchoring. You lower yourself to get strong. You don't exalt yourself to get strong. You, you hold yourself tight to get strong. So the Bible says that Jesus, he, he lowered himself. And, and because he did, God exalted him and lifted him higher and gave him a, a name that's above every name. Now, to be exalted means to be lifted to the highest rank. God lifted Jesus to the highest rank possible. He gave him the highest position, the highest authority. There is no seat upon his seat. There is, there is no realm above the realm of Christ. There is nothing beyond that. So in other words, God says, I make you equal with what? And there is nothing above you. There's nothing above, there's nothing above you. He exalted him. But now he be exalted. The Bible says that, that what he did, he gave him the name. Not a name, not one of many names, but the name. The name that is above every name. The name of Jesus is the only name, the single name, the singular name that's above every other name. There's no other name you can call. Why? Because it is attached to Jesus. Now get this. There's other people in the Bible named Jesus. There's other folk in the Bible. So it's not the letters of the name. It's not the, the phonetics of the name. And it's not the pronouncement of the name. But it's the combination of the spirit and the one who wears it. It's the one, the combination of the one who, who, who God has called and the one that is on. So just because you call yourself something, don't mean you're that. Just because you wear a title, don't mean you're that. Just because you sit in the chair, don't mean that you're that. You have to be the character of a person because Jesus was humble before God and he wore Jehovah in salvation. His life and who he was and his name matched. And, when it, when, and that made that he was above everything else. I can say I love people. And really can, and all came in, cussing folk out and watching somebody else starve to death. Because what I say and what I do and who I am don't match. And therefore, I, I create a, a failure in that complex. But God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who he was in character, who he was in action and behavior, and who he was by title and name all came together. And therefore, there is none. There is none greater. That he got the name, the only name that's above every other name. Because no matter who else you call or what else you call, it got a problem. Even COVID-19 got a weakness. We're hunting for it. As soon as we find the vaccine, we will expose the weakness of COVID-19. And we know how to bring it down. We already know how to fight it to dismantle it. Stay at home. Stay six feet from each other. But see, you don't find no weakness like that in Jesus. Where can you go that he's not there? Who can you talk to that he don't know? Why can you discover that he didn't show you? There is no weakness in our God. There's a name. He got the only name that's above every other name. There's none like him. 
He is Jesus. And when we come to recognize that, we'll discover the humble obedience. When we're humble and we're obedient before God. It keeps us, it keeps us in the midst of God's blessing and faith. We live under God's favor because we're obedient, humbly obedient, just submitted to being obedient, submitted to discovering, committed to discovery, uh, accountable to ourselves and God to remain faithful. Say, yes, God, I hold myself accountable. I will do your will. I will trust you in the midst of every situation. Because when we can do that, it keeps us intimately, our, our humble obedience keep us intimately connected to the Father. Keep us, keep us in there. See, the core, the core of Jesus' uh, 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 authority on earth, the, the core, the, the center of Jesus' ability and, and his mission on earth was, was the fact that God the Father exalted him. If God hadn't exalted him, raised him, lifted him, resurrected him, validated him, this is my son, and who I am well pleased. If God had not validated him, Father, I trust you, but for them, raise this man, Lazarus, come. if God had not validated him, then his, his earthly ministry would have lost steam. But because God exalted him, that's the core of his earthly ministry. And he can say, because God is pleased with me, I can do his will in the land. Because God is pleased. So if we're going to have an intimate relationship with God, we got to live so God can validate our lives. Live so God can, can, can point at us and say, well done. I'm well pleased. That's right. Go ahead. God can, can release the, the cloud of witnesses to cheer us on because we're running in the right direction. When we're lifting the right weights, we're, we're fighting the right, the right battles. We got to say, God, I want you to be pleased so he can be, we can have this intimate relationship with him. Now, the strength of his relationship, the strength of Jesus' relationship, this Bible text tells us, was his humble obedience. Because he was obedient, God blessed him. God exalted him. So if we pull a page from that, if we take this for our lives, the, the strength, the, 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 the source, the power, the assurance that you become acceptable to God is that you live a life dedicated to pleasing him. If I live a life committed, humble, or a life lowered to his power, not just raising one finger when I tip out of church, not just driving a bow my head when I pray and hope that God he may give me what I want, but when I live my life, when you live your life committed to God and say, God, you deserve to have authority over my life. God, it is right for me to obey you. God, it is the right order of things for you to be in charge, for you to be my master, for me to be your slave. It is right. It is correct. I agree with you. I don't challenge what you tell me. I don't correct what you tell me. I just hear to understand so I can obey. God, that's what I'm here for. When we live that way, the strength of our life, that humble obedience brings us into a place where God says, come on up here. Let me use you because I can use you over more stuff now. He can bless us and keep us when we do that thing. Because our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, he, he keeps us humble. Look at it. Jesus humbled himself. God exalted. And now the job of the people, the job of all of creation, those who accept him and those who don't have the same job. And we're all going to do our job. And we're all going to do it well. And that, that is that one day we're all going to bow before him. And we're going to proclaim him as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. We're all going to worship at the feet of the Lamb. We're all going to glorify God. We're all going to bow our knees, our knees and proclaim with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody's going to do it. Saved, unsaved. The atheist, the, 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 the most faithful Christian. We're all going to do the same thing, and we're all going to say the same thing. We're all going to bow knees and open mouth and proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. It is going to happen. We're all going to do it. So look at it. Jesus humbles himself. God exalts him, and creation worships him. What a God we serve. Jesus humbles himself. God exalts him and creation worship him. Now take that and, and lower it down to our level. We, we humble ourselves. God gives us strength and the devil got to flee. We humble ourselves. God lifts us up and the enemy got to leave us alone. We humble ourselves and God exalts us and Satan got to turn around and find a new way to attack because the people of God is standing strong. Humility, exaltation, and worship. 
humility, exaltation, the will of God. Humble yourself so God can lift you up. Do it. That's what we need to do. That's how we live. That's what we're about. Because when we do that, God is to be glorified. God is to be magnified. We worship together. We magnify God together. Your strength is staying low in the presence of God. Your strong place is staying hidden in the tower of God. Your, 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 your place of comfort and peace is a mind that says God is right. And whatever comes my way, God can handle. He'll use it. He'll glorify. It, he'll sanctify. It. If I stay humble, he, one day he's going to exalt me. He's going to lift me up. The time is coming either in time or, in or eternity, where he's going to exalt me above everything that's attacking me. The time is going to come, either in this place, in this world, or the next, that God lifts us up and says, my child, well done. Never will you have to go through that again, because he lifts us there, and he makes us strong enough and secure enough and safe enough. So we ain't got to do it again. So what am I saying? Jesus said to God, stay strong. Stay faithful. Do it. But, but stay in the place of your strength. Trust God. Humble. Humble is the way. Humble is the way. Humble yourself before God. That don't mean you have to be weak. That don't mean you have to deny the gifts and the talents that God has put in you. But it does mean that every gift, every strength, every talent, when it's viewed in light of God, in your mind, becomes nothing. And you can say, God, use all the nothing that I bring in here and use it to your glory. I have nothing of real significance to offer you, but I offer you all that I am. Use me to your glory. God, I don't know what you can do with the bundles of mistakes and failures and accidents and doubts and fears that I bring to you. But I trust God that you can work miracles. In you. So God, take all of this, all of me, my life, past, present, and future, and use it to your glory. Don't be humiliated. Be humble. Live a life of humility. That's your strong place. Serve God and serve him well. God bless you, people of God. God bless you, saints. We serve a magnificent God. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? You may be driven by fear, but he's calling you in love. He's given his life for you, and he wants to give you life. On this side of COVID-19 and on the other side, he wants to give you life eternal. He wants to love you. That you can live the rest of your life on this earth, glorifying him, getting to know him, and being blessed by him. It's really, it's really not hard. Jesus has done all the heavy lifting. Jesus gave his life to pay for your sin. Jesus fought the battle in hell to deliver you from a place of eternal bondage. And Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, interceding, calling you by name, Pray that you will answer the call and give your life to him. Jesus has done all the heavy lifting. All you have to do is come to the table and eat. Will you come? Will you come and give your life to him? It's really simple. You admit that you're a sinner. That simply means that you've lived your life without respect or honor to God's authority. You ask him to forgive you. You repent. That simply means that you're now deciding, making a conscious decision that you will live your life in obedience to God's authority in his will. And then you say, thank you, God, for being my, my Lord. You invite him into your life and you live the rest of your life as one big thank you for the salvation he's given you. That everything you do be done to his glory and to his honor. Yes, it's, it's really all you have to do. And if you do that, he will save you for all of eternity. And you can live your life knowing him, loving him, and being blessed by him. 
I'm going to say a prayer, and I ask that you would pray it with me. If you mean this prayer, God will have saved you, and you need to go tell somebody, find the Bible, call a friend, let them know that you made a decision for Christ. But it's going to be short, it's going to be simple, but you have to mean it from your heart. Amen? Let's pray. God, I've lived with no regard for your authority, not even sure if you were real. But Lord, now I've decided that you are the ultimate reality. And you have the only true voice. You are the only one with true authority. So I submit myself to you. I accept the truth of the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. And I accept the salvation that he offers to me. God, I pray that you will make me your child. I invite you into my heart, into my life. And I give myself completely to you. Thank you, God, for saving me. And thank you, Lord, for making me your child. And now I commit to you in this covenant agreement that I will live my life to bring you glory. I will live my life always trying to say thank you for this life that you've given me. It's in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. God bless you, friends. If you if you prayed that prayer and you uh, meant it from your heart, call somebody. Call a Christian that you know. Call a pastor. Uh, get on Facebook. Do something. Let someone know that you just gave your life to Jesus Christ and you want them to help you walk the journey or you want to know who can help you. If you need a Bible, ask for it. Somebody's going to get you a Bible. But let's make sure that we live faithfully before God. Can we do that? God bless you, saints of God. God bless you, people of God. Our First Lady is going to come now and lead us in our Holy Communion. I pray that you have prepared for it and let us take communion together. Amen. Good morning, saints of God. What a word from our pastor this morning. Amen. What a word. We're going to humble ourselves to the Lord. So that he can exalt us and lift us to do what he has for us to do. We're going to prepare our hearts and minds to take the Lord's Supper at this time. So I'm going to ask you to make sure that you have your crackers, your juice, or whatever have you, so that we can share together. The Bible reminds us that as often as we do this, we remember what the Lord has done for us. How he lived a sinless life. How he died on the cross. How he went to the grave and got up on the third day and ascended unto heaven after that. We believe that. But it wasn't cheap. It cost him a beating. It cost him a crucifixion. Because our sins are heinous. But thank God, he took our punishment so we don't have to. And the Bible tells us that he went upstairs with his followers and they shared a meal. At the end of the meal, the Bible tells us he took the bread, lifted it up to heaven, blessed it, broke it, and passed it around and said, this is my body. Eat it, because it's broken for you. And then he lifted up the cup in the same way and blessed it. He said, this is my blood, which is shared for you. Drink it and drink all of it. So we're going to share in the body and the blood of Christ at this time. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to make us fit. And then we will remember what he has done. Let's pray. Lord, we ask your rich blessings on the elements that we're going to use to remember what you have done. We pray, Lord, in the midst of it that you would forgive us for all of our sins, anything we've sought, thought or said or did or didn't do, we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Make us fit to partake of your body. We pray you bless the bread and bless the cup. In Jesus' name, amen. Body of our Lord and our Savior. 
Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord and Savior. Let us eat together. Let us drink together. Eating and drinking all of it. On that day, they didn't have a benediction like we usually do at church. But at the end of that, Jesus went to the garden to be betrayed. So they just sung a hymn on the way out to remind them that it was still worship. So you and I, we have a world to go into. Thankfully, not a garden that we have to ask God to let the cup pass because our Savior already drank it. So live a life that pleases him, a life that is humble so that he can exalt us even in the midst of COVID-19 with wisdom and care. We want to thank you for being in the worship today. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We thank you for being who you are. Okay, Hope Church, we thank you for joining us today on our live stream. What a word. We appreciate all who have gathered and celebrated the Lord with us today. And we want to encourage you to continue. Um, to be humble, to be faithful, to be committed, to live a life in service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that every day at 8 a.m., we have our motivational word. Uh, we also have a Bible study on Thursdays at noon, and uh, we have early morning prayer at 6 a.m. on Wednesday. So come on, let's continue to be faithful. Let's continue to love each other, support each other, and encourage one another as we continue to just see Jesus. God bless you. See you soon, Hope.